This week, we outmaneuver our opponents. The heretofore untested command of General Sheridan shows his brilliance, and why Philip is a key to ending this war, as the Valley of Virginia sees the light of liberty once more, and the politics of the presidency see the sly Lincoln show that he is more than an order. The leaders of the Union are no fools. This week is their demonstration. Let's get straight to the point. The Valley. 17th, Grant and Sheridan break off from each other. The General-in-Chief competent in his comrade's command. Lieutenant General Jubal Early, commanding the Army of the Valley. It's just the 2nd Corps and some cavalry. Spends the 18th trying to chase down Union cavalry. His forces arrive near Martinsburg in pursuit of General Avril. Nightfall of the 18th. The Confederate cavalry is at Martinsburg. General Gordon is at Bunker Hill. Officer Rhodes is on the march to Commander Warden at Stephenson's Depot. Ramsher is covering Berryville. Sheridan has his golden opportunity. If the swiftness of his soldiers is true, he can destroy the rebel army. General Tobert and Merritt will take their cavalry against the depot. Avril will meet up with them. Wilson's cavalry will capture the crossings at Opaquan. The victory will follow. A beautiful plan, but its execution requires 33,000 men marching down a single road, undetected, moving through bottlenecks. To ease the work, wagons are left behind, but that does make resupply possible. 0500, the trampling of hooves, the beautiful blue torch over the earthworks at Opaquan, and dismount. Ramsher's rebels begin a bombardment, and charge the men of Wilson. They steady their fire, and with the quickness of their breech waters, repulse the Confederates. General Horatio Wright brings his 6th Corps forward, ready to break the defeated Ramsher. 0900 hours, the division of the 6th are in fierce battle with Ramsher and Rhodes. Despite the speed of Sheridan, the rebels have reinforced their lone division. Soon arrives a 3rd Great Division under General Gordon. Sheridan's plan has failed. Instead of defeating isolated enemy units, he now must engage with a concentrated opponent. He provides a new assault. Over 100 hours, the 19th Corps is rushed to the right of right, where they advance. Wilson has moved south to cut off early's retreat. General Crook and his Army of West Virginia are first sent with Wilson, but then ordered to move north of the 19th Corps. It's an aggressive plan. Only one division of General Russell was held in reserve. The two forward Federal Corps push back the competent Confederates. When the rush, a gap opens, and General Rhodes with a fresh brigade charges in, where the rest of his division and Gordon follow. The fighting is fierce. We are pushed back, but in the chaos, General Robert Rhodes is struck dead by a shell. The, revers the reserve division of Russell is now deployed, sensing weakness on the flanks. For the strength of arms, the rebels are forced back, but Russell is also struck dead by a shell. Many men lost, and the two sides are back where they started. The lines are exhausted, and stalemate is apparent, but General Crook is now positioned with General Alfred Torbett's cavalry. They strike Early's reserves. 7,000 brought to bear against half their number. It's a shining victory, as the rebel line begins to fold into an L shape. Early realizes he has lost, begins the evacuation. He sends cavalry south to keep the line of retreat open, wisely holding back Wilson's cavalry from closing their exit. General Crook begins his advance, slamming into the northern section of the rebels. Hard pressed, the men of Early are not prepared for the concerto of battle. Joe Torbert arranges two divisions of cavalry, 7,000 sabers, and orders them forward. General George Custer in the lead. The rebels begin to fall back in good order, keeping their artillery. Early receives a report there was a breakthrough, and a general retreat begins. It was actually Ramsey's division. The cavalry charge cuts down their opponents. Individually, the Confederates begin to run, seeking shelter and safety. The rout of the rebels causes chaos in the streets of Winchester. Rebel officer George Patton is killed trying to rally his men. The wives of the routing men try to restore order, but all is lost. Winchester, Virginia. Winchester, Virginia has changed hands 73 times, but this is the last. Sheridan writes to Rebecca Wright, the school teacher that gave him the great assistance, and writes to Grant in her schoolroom of the great victory. Again, the battle, the losses of Sheridan were greater than early. But Rowe's army is decimated. He lost Rhodes, a divisional commander. Colonel Patton and George Godwin, brigade commanders. Fitzugly and Zebulon York are wounded. Five cans and nine regimental standards are gone. Sheridan lost only one divisional commander. The men and leaders early lost were irreplaceable. Sheridan receives a note of thanks from President Lincoln and a promotion from Secretary Edwin Stanton. But he does not sit on his laurels. Early is still in the valley. With only 75% of his army, Jewel brings his forces to the fortified Fisher Hill. It looks over Tumbling Run. 
Sheridan can't go around it. He can't fling throwables off it. He has to fight on their terms. But to do so, he has no mobile reserves. Lomax's cavalry division forced to dismount to fill the line. He just needs to hold for long enough. Colonel Joseph Kershaw has reversed his march to reinforce early. Fitzog's old cavalry division has begun the trip to the Army of the Valley. Sheridan is moving quicker than the enemy could ever expect. As the sun lights the 20th, he's already marching. Four row pickets at Strasbourg are forced from the town. By nightfall, the Union is in striking distance. The consensus on the 21st reveals Confederate weakness. On the 22nd, battle begins. The blue of the tree hold the front of the gray fortifications. The cavalry move in on the flanks. With the Army of West Virginia, General George Crook swims into the flanks of Lomax's dismounted men. The two other infantry corps join in. Forward! Forward everything! Go on! Don't stop! Go on! Rebels break, and their divisions crumble. The remaining artillery of early falls into Sheridan's hand at a low cost. With the back-to-back -back defeats in the valley, Early's army is truly broken, but Sheridan isn't done yet. The cavalry officer Devon pursue the enemy, breaking the rebel rearguard and capturing another two heavy guns. The 23rd, the cavalry continues the pursuit, this time under General Avril, who pulls back once a flanking attack is detected, allowing for Early to escape. By the end of the week, Sheridan has won. His opponents have been broken under the hooves of his cavalry men. At a great cost, he has won over even his strongest skeptics. The nation rises a toast to Will Phil. Missouri, my home state. Major General Sterling Price has returned with 12,000 men, 8,000 armed. That is not a joke. He seriously couldn't give one-third of his men weapons. Moves on to Fayette. No great results. Carthage is next, followed by Rochport as he slowly moves towards his end goal, St. Louis. A long way to return to Indian Territory is realized in the Second Battle of Cabin Creek, where a supply train convoy is ambushed by the rebels. They win. Wow, what a return. Now for something interesting. The Lake Erie Conspiracy, and I'm not talking Bassey. John Yates Bell is a spy and saboteur. His past is baited and not much is known. By his own mission, the 18th, he assembled a crew of 18 and entered the Union from Canada. His goal is to free the prisoners around Lake Erie, but fortunes turn when a Confederate captain is discovered and a quick retreat is forced. Bale escapes, ready for his next plot. The 23rd Major General Stephen A. Hobart takes over Banks' command, the Department of the Gulf. The truth is, I don't know why this happened. Banks has been kept in command by his political pull. With the election coming up, his support for Lincoln is needed now more than ever. Richmond, Virginia. Confederate President Jefferson Davis is struggling. His breakaway nation is broken. The West has fallen. He needs to sit together in defense against Sherman. First, he writes to a nervous Georgia congressman. No, it can't. But to further aid this delusion, he demands submission, I mean harmony, from state governors. He is worried about them demanding conscription of foreigners who are needed to fulfill the jobs that keep the secession in the present tense. Sherman's army can be driven out of Georgia, perhaps utterly destroyed. Twentieth, he hops on a train to Georgia to hopefully pull together a force that can face Sherman. Chugga chugga! The screeching halt is heard. Davis arrives in Macon, Georgia. He's surrounded by refugees. He is desperate to make way to Hood, as he heard rumors of an audacious plan to strike north and bring the battle to Lincoln. But first he must speak to those ravaged by war. Friends are drawn together in adversity. Our cause is not lost. Sherman cannot keep up his long line of communication, and retreat sooner or later he must. Hopefully Hood can fulfill this promise. As General Hood prepares to bring the bow to the north, General Force is way ahead of him. He has raids in northern Alabama and southern Tennessee. Capture of federal fortifications, not through strength of arms, but deception. In 1860, President Lincoln was elected by a three-way split in the Democratic Party. Now in 1864, he faced his potential defeat by a split in the Republican Party. Former General, former Senator, and former Republican presidential candidate John C. Fremont has broken off with the radical elements of the party to form the Radical Democracy Party. And if they siphon off enough votes, McClellan might win. Lincoln needs Fremont gone. First, he writes to Sherman, hoping for his soldiers to rejoin the electorate. The state election of Indiana occurs on the 11th of October. The loss of it to the friends of the government would go far towards losing the whole Union cause. Indiana is the only important state voting in October. Soldiers cannot vote in the field. Anything you can safely do to let our soldiers or any part of them go home and vote at the state election will be greatly in point. They need not remain for the presidential election, but may return to you at once. Yours truly, A. Lincoln. The victories at Atlanta Mobile, the support of soldiers, 
It's still not enough. The track must be cleared. Through informal contacts, a plan seems to form. Senator Zachary Chandler goes back and forth with the executive. Obnoxious members of the administration should be removed. When things finally are hashed out, Chandler goes to Fremont and Lincoln writes letters. You have generously said to me more than once that whenever your resignation could be relieved to me, it was at my disposal. The time has come. You very well know that this proceeds from no dissatisfaction. You know very well that this proceeds from no dissatisfaction of mine with you personally or officially. Your uniform kindness has been unsurpassed by that of any friend. While it is true that the war does not so clearly add to the difficulties of your apartment as those of some others, it is yet much to say, as I most truly can, in the three years and a half during which you have administered the general post office, I remember no single complaint against you in connection therewith. I have received your note of this date, referring to my offers to resign whenever you should deem it advisable for the public interest. I should do so in stating that in your judgment that time has now come. I now therefore formally tender my resignation of the office of Postmaster General. I cannot take leave of you without renewing the expressions of my gratitude for the uniform kindness just marked your course towards yours very truly yours very truly M. Blair. Immediately turning around, Lincoln offers the post to former Governor William Dennison. Mr. Blair has resigned, and I point you the Postmaster General. Come on immediately, A. Lincoln. Fremont thus withdraws to ensure that McClellan won't see the highest office. Like that, the devil deal is done. The funny thing is, Lincoln is still supported by Blair. He planned on campaigning for him. The real victim of this quid pro quo is us. Cabinet positions are once again for sale. Sickless time, he... Uh, that's where the week ends, and there are two paths. The removal of Fremont and the victories of the Valley. As the election of 1864 is ongoing, let's instead focus on Sheridan. He went from a division to an army command in just a few months. His failed raid on Richmond and slow start in the Valley brought him much criticism. But let's look at his accomplishments. He killed Jeb Stewart. He defeated the opposing Confederate cavalry. He has now smashed the rebels under Early. I believe in Sheridan. And next week, I'm sure we will see further triumphs. Hi, it's the Tire Civil War Week. Hi, it's the Tire Civil War Week by Week team here. I'd like to thank everyone for watching. And just want to put up a warning. Not that was likely to happen. The week by week series might not make it to the end of the war completed. I will complete the series. With school ramping up, it might take a little bit longer. I don't know about the decision. I just wanted it to not come as a warning or out of nowhere. Thank you, and I will see you next week. See you then.